Welcome back to My Classic Car. This week we're in Cedar Rapids, Iowa for the American Motors Owners Association's 96th International Convention. The Iowa chapter of the AMO cleverly adopted the slogan, If we host it, they will come, and then continued that theme in naming the convention the Show Field of Dreams. Stay tuned, because you'll want to see some of these classic American Motors cars later on in the program. Our classic designers and engineers feature this week is about Pete Brock, the man who designed the legendary Shelby Daytona Coupe. Pete Brock's automotive design career could have been a Hollywood script. By age 23, this beach boy from Southern California had designed two legendary cars, the 63 Stingray Coupe and the Daytona Cobra Coupe. Pete vividly remembers the exact moment he fell in love with cars. He was 12 years old when an old mechanic gave him a ride he'd never forget. We took off for a test run through the hills of Marin County and it changed my life. It was really, I think, one of those pivotal moments you have in your life and I was so young and it affected me so deeply that uh, I really fell in love with cars at that time. After high school, Pete's passion for cars would drive him to enroll at the Art Center College of Design in Los Angeles. He had no design experience, but a lot of enthusiasm. So I went into the office and said, I want to go to school here. And they said, well, that's fine. What's your portfolio? And I mean, to give you an idea how naive I was, I said, what's a portfolio? You know, they said, well, you have to bring, you know, examples of your work. And I said, well, I don't have any work. That's why I want to go to school here, you know. Halfway through, Pete's money ran out, and he was forced to drop out of school. But he had talent, and one of his instructors set up an interview with General Motors. A couple of weeks later, Pete, at age 19, became one of the youngest designers ever at the GM Design Center. A short time later, in early 59, his good fortune continued, as he began work on one of Bill Mitchell's pet projects, the Stingray Coupe. Chuck Pellman and myself, uh, laid out the lines for the, that car, and that eventually uh, moved into another studio. Larry Shinoda came in and finished the car up with uh, Mitchell, and that became the prototype for the Stingray, which has developed into the production car in 1963. While Pete loved working for GM, he still yearned for a way to combine his design talents with his fondness for racing. So in the early 60s, he left GM and headed back to Southern California. A few months later, Pete befriended a young racer named Carol Shelby. The two hit it off, and Pete went to work for Shelby American, doing design work on everything, including the Shelby Mustangs. But the crown jewel in Pete's portfolio was the design of the legendary Daytona Cobra Coupe. When it finally, you know, developed up to the point where he said, you know, I think we're going to go to Europe. Can you design a car? Well, I had all the background there to do it, and I said, of course, I know exactly what I wanted to do. So I sketched up what I wanted to do, and it was based pretty much on uh, uh, a lot of studies that I'd read about that the Germans had done in the late 30s. So when I presented the car sort of the, the shop, there was major, major negativity toward the car. Uh, when we went out and tested it at Riverside, and it was three seconds a lap faster than anything we'd ever run out there, then everybody began to see the value of it, and they jumped in, and everybody began to put their own uh, you know, effort into it, and it became a success. By 1966, Shelby American had undergone many changes, and Pete was considered expendable when Shelby agreed to take over the Ford GT40 racing project. So Pete left and started his own racing program and turned the Datsun 240Zs into winners in the early 70s. Today, he spends much of his time writing and recently authored a book about the Daytona Coupes. Pete Brock, a classic designer, and creator of the Daytona Coupe. Welcome back to My Classic Car. This show field of dreams for American Motors cars marks the 20th anniversary of the national and international meets for AMO. We talked to some of the proud owners and organizers here at the 96th International Convention. So this is the 20th uh, annual meet, is that right, Carol? Yes, it is. It's actually the 20th anniversary of our shows. The club was a little bit older than that, but it was 1976 before we really got started. We got our start in Kenosha, naturally, because that's where all the cars were built, and that's where the enthusiasm was, and it expanded beyond that. 
And then by the time we got into the 80s, when uh, the cars were becoming more collectible, especially the muscle cars and the earlier 60s cars, at that time we started moving out a little bit and Chapter started hosting our meets. Well, we hosted it in 1991 after going to a lot of conventions and seeing all the fun that the other chapters have hosting a convention. So uh, after doing it in 91, we found out it was a lot of fun, a lot of work, but a lot of fun, and we uh, petitioned AMO to allow us to do it again. Well, Jeff, this is a sleek black beauty. She's a 73 AMX, right? Correct. How long have you owned it? 17 years. Wow, and restored when? 1992. Well, it's got some unique options on it, several, but, but I think the most unique is the Pierre Cardin interior. Tell me about it. How many well, of those were made? Uh, about 2,500, they say, in uh, 1973. Uh, fairly small option, just a headliner. The seats, the door trim panels, and the fender albums. It was a whopping $84.95 option. What a deal. How many of them do you think are left? Uh, I did a registry a few years ago, and I had 14 responses. Caroline, a 69 AMX, beautiful one with a 390, and you're the original owner? Yes, I am. You gotta tell me the story. <laughs> I had a, an ambassador convertible that needed service, and in order to have that, I had to take it to Sacramento and wait for the service. While I was there, I asked the salesman if the AMC made a sports car, and he said, lady, did they? So, the next thing I knew, I was doing 80 on the entrance to the expressway. <laughs> And I imagine you still have some fun with it. Yes, I do. Every time I stop for a red light, there are kids in the car next to me and they want to know, they look at me and then they look at the car and then they look at me. And then they say, hey lady, that's an awfully nice car. Is it for sale? And I just say, no it isn't. <laughs> and that's it. I bet you're still the first off the line. Yes, I am. <laughs> and I like being first across the street. Although American Motors faced severe financial problems in the late 60s, they still managed to field the player in Detroit's pony car wars the Javelin. This Mustang and Camaro rival was introduced in 1968 and initially sold like hotcakes. Several months later, the AMX, AMC's most feared muscle car, made its debut. The two-seat AMX was a shortened Javelin that packed a potent V8 under its attractive hood. We traveled to Pennsylvania to see and drive one of the finest AMXs in the world. Well, here we are in Denver, Pennsylvania, in Chris Zinn's garage, which also doubles as an AMC AMX shrine. Chris, welcome. Thank you very much for coming out, Dennis. You got a beautiful 69 AMX. Tell me all about this baby. It's a big, bad orange car. They only made 284 big, bad orange cars. They also made big, bad green and big, bad blue. In 1969, they featured painted bumpers. Uh, in 70, they had the same color scheme, but they had chrome bumpers. This car here features factory air and four-speed transmission, as well as dealer-installed side pipes. Now, is the, were the stripes part of the GO package? Is that what That's correct. And racing stripes over the top stripes were part of the GO package. And the painted bumpers were only in 69? Only in 69, only in the big, bad color cars. One of the toughest pieces to get was this stainless steel strip uh, that was part of the big, bad package to continue that look around the grill. Another piece that's unique is a Group 19 spoiler. It's a stainless steel spoiler. They made the fiberglass spoiler and a stainless steel spoiler. So that would have been dealer installed? That was a dealer installed option, yes. Well, let's look at the power plant. 390, 315 horsepower, four barrel carburetor. And it is dead stock? Dead stock. Again, the factory air conditioning. All the four speed cars had smog equipment on. The automatic cars did not have smog equipment on. They didn't need it uh, as far as the federal uh, regulations are concerned. Difficult to restore because the first thing guys with four speeds wanted to do was hot rod and that was the first thing that came off the car. As we stated before, it has the trendsetter sidewinder side pipes. That they was were, another dealer installed. That's correct. It's a dealer installed uh, item. It was a, had an AM part number for it. Uh, a lot of people think that's incorrect, but it's, it's a dealer installed correct item. So everything from the door forward on an AMX and a Javelin are the same? Absolutely correct. Everything's the same. The glass, the hoods, the fenders, everything. The hood's a little bit different and the uh, grill. As you mentioned, it's a two-seater. That's right. Fairly rare at that time. That's right. Plenty of space 
to store your luggage in different gear. Now that seat uh, does some other tricks too. They couldn't forget where they came from. Back to the Nash days. Back to the Nash days indeed. Now how about the, uh, the instruments and, and gauges? It's pretty much uh, standard in instruments and gauges. They had, the only th option would be the clock. Uh, and then with the big bad cars, they made the change in, uh, in the spring of 69 and they went with the Hearst shifter, which was a much better shifter than the AMC shifter that uh, was originally on the cars. Now that's kind of a unique uh, spare. That's correct, Dennis. This, this came out in 1968 with the AMX, and they were the, one of the first people to use a Space Saver spare. The first thing people say at a car show when they come around and look at the trunk, they say, boy, they didn't have them back then. They only had them in the 70s. No, AMC was ahead of their time. It's amazing. Well, we've had sort of a rainy day here, Chris, but it's, it's letting up. I'm wondering if it breaks, we might just take this for a cruise. I hope so. Let's uh, go check the weather. Thank you, Dennis. Ha, 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 ha.